welcome to my review of the 1986 film Manhunter and the 2002 film Red Dragon. I'll be comparing and contrasting the two, which are both based on Thomas Harris's Red Dragon novel, the first to feature the character of Hannibal Lecter. Manhunter has William Peterson as Will Graham, Kim Greist as his wife Molly, Joan Allen plays blind photo lab technician Reba McLean, Dennis Farina is Graham's boss, Jack Crawford. Tom Noonan is the psychopath, Francis Dollarhide. And Brian Cox takes on the role of Hannibal Lecter. In Red Dragon, Edward Norton plays Graham. Mary Louise Parker is Molly. Emily Watson is Reba. Harvey Keitel plays Crawford, taking over from Scott Glenn, who played the role in Silence of the Lambs. Francis... Dollarhide is played by Ray Fiennes and Anthony Hopkins returns to play Lecter for the third and final time after playing him in Silence of the Lambs and Hannibal previously. Manhunter was written and directed by Michael Mann and Red Dragon was written by Ted Talley and directed by Brett Ratner. Because this is a comparison review there will be spoilers from the start. So if you don't want to know what happens in either film, go and watch them first. So I haven't read the book, but from what I understand, the 2002 adaptation skews much closer to the book than Manhunter does. The question is, does that make it a better film? And in my opinion, the answer is no. The basic plot is that Will Graham has stepped back back from criminal investigations after his ordeal capturing Hannibal Lecter. But his old boss Jack Crawford needs his help to catch a new serial killer, one they've dubbed the Tooth Fairy, due to his habit of biting his victims. Red Dragon arguably has the better cast, certainly the more well-known cast, but I don't think that necessarily works in its favour. The difference in performances between the two films seem like night and day, almost as if the cast of Red Dragon is purposely doing the exact opposite of what the cast of Manhunter did. Norton's Graham is very dispassionate and professional and gives no real sense he's affected by the events of the plot or of his encounter with Lecter. Whereas, by contrast, Peterson's Graham is haunted by Lecter and immediately emotionally invests in the new case. He carries with him the trauma on his face and in his body language and in the way he acts and with the exception of a few fleeting moments it's pretty clear he is deeply involved in his work, perhaps a little too involved. There's a scene early on in both films where Graham visits the Tooth Fairy's first crime scene. Pearson's Graham has a deeply physical and emotional reaction when he's investigating the scene, making it clear to the audience that he's probably not ready to return to his job, but because of the nature of his character, he's driven to catch the killer. Norton's Graham is far more dispassionate and seems largely unaffected by his ordeal, or the horrific murders that have taken place in the house he's in. Graham feels far more like a human being throughout Manhunter, whereas Red Dragon's Graham feels more like a character in a movie. Hannibal Lecter, whose role in Red Dragon is greatly expanded due to the popularity of the character, is also starkly different in each film. Hopkins is superb as Hannibal Lecter. Creepy and dangerous, sly, terrifying, but ultimately compelling. In Silence of the Lambs. In Red Dragon, it, all, it feels almost like someone doing an Anthony Hopkins impression. I think partly due to the slavish recreations of the Silence of the Lambs sets, and partly down to the dialogue seeming like it's trying to capture the magic of his first appearance 
it feels like it's a parody of the character and Hopkins just doesn't want to be there also in order to facilitate the expansion of his role there is an unnecessary prologue in Red Dragon where we get to see how Graham catches Lecter. They were consulting on a case and Graham thinks the killer is eating parts of his victims and is surprised the genius psychologist Lecter missed this potentially crucial detail. Graham works out what's really going on when he glances at a cookbook on Lecter's bookshelf. It completely demystifies their relationship and makes Graham seem lucky rather than good at his job. In Manhunter, their entire encounter is left to our imagination, which I think works so much better when in both films, when we first see Graham go to visit Lecter in prison, he tells Lecter he didn't catch him because he's smarter than him, but rather because he had an advantage because Lecter is completely insane. This line doesn't really work in Red Dragon because we know exactly what happened. It wasn't because Lecter was insane, it was pure chance. Lecter stabs Graham and Graham fights back by stabbing Lecter with a quiver full of arrows which were clearly established a few scenes earlier. He then shoots him a ridiculous amount of times which Lecter somehow survives uh, but not seeing it in Manhunter allows us to fill in the gaps in our imagination as to how that encounter went down and I think it's far more powerful. To use a Jaws analogy they showed us too much of the shark. Brian Cox's Lecter by contrast is played much more low-key and feels more like a real psychopath. He's charming but unspectacular. He's very matter of fact but also taunts Will at every occasion and clearly wants his revenge. Cox is not as good in Manhunter as Hopkins is in Silence of the Lambs but he's much better than Hopkins is in Red Dragon. So the killer that Graham has been brought back to catch, the Tooth Fairy, whose real name is Francis Dollarhide, is another very different character in both films. In Manhunter, Tom Noonan is an odd-looking, tall, skinny, gangly creature with wild hair and a cold intensity that is frightening when he's in killer mode. We first see him with a stocking covering the top half of his head as he terrorises his victim and it's pretty disturbing. We have to be introduced to him in this way as if we saw him in his everyday life first it would be pretty clear he's the killer. However when we do see him acting normally when he's at work we can understand how no one would suspect he's a psychopath because despite his unusual appearance he's a perfectly normal if somewhat slightly shy man. He asks his colleague Reba on a date when she loses her ride home and she says yes because he seems nice and because she's blind she doesn't judge him on his appearance. There's a certain amount of tension because we know he's a psychopath but the more time they spend together the more it seems she may actually curb his psychotic tendencies. In his way he falls in love with her. Uh, he even weeps when they have sex because he knows what he's done is wrong but can't take it back. Eventually his true nature does come through which we know will happen but the tension comes from not knowing exactly when that's going to happen. In contrast, we spend much more time with Dollarhide in Red Dragon, but the whole thing seems far more of a cliché. His appearance is that of a handsome man, he looks like Ray Fiennes, with a small scar on his lip, which, due to a childhood of torture by his mother, he thinks makes him look hideous. He is attracted to Reba because she won't judge him. But she knows he's handsome because colleagues at work have told her repeatedly, apparently, and she tells him that. 
it means that the reason for her blindness is, is entirely down to a plot convenience rather than any character building. He also acts and speaks like a complete psychopath the whole time. Ride with me. For my pleasure. This would leave no one who's met him with any doubt that he's dangerous and feels very unlikely that Reba would be interested in dating him. Apart from the fact that she also acts and speaks like a psychopath. It's a really odd choice by Emily Watson to play the character so strangely. They ask me if you are as strong as you look. Joan Allen plays the role as if she's a normal person falling in love with a guy who she likes um, because she likes the sound of him. Watson makes it seem like she might in fact be into the fact that Dollar Hides kills people. She's oddly sexually aggressive, has a way of speaking that makes her seem like there's a subtext behind everything she says, and regularly has some kind of lethal weapon to hand. It's actually a bit of a surprise when she turns out to be horrified by the revelation of who he really is. I understand this version of Dollarhide is closer to the book, but I don't think it works for the modern audience. He's a checklist of builder psycho tropes, from a mother who tortured him, to hearing voices, to paranoia and an obsession that reaches its peak when he steals a painting from a museum and eats it. A truly out of place scene that is more likely to elicit laughs. He's also far more calculating. Having planned to use Reba to fake his own death, which manages to fool Graham in a way which seems out of place for such an unhinged character, he isn't as calculating as and coordinated as Lecter. He's manic and unpredictable, and gets more so as the film goes on. Planning his escape in order to go after Graham and his family in a way that doesn't fit with how we've seen the character throughout the rest of the film and how he devolves just doesn't work. Manhunter ignores that ending and goes for a simple confrontation between Graham and Dollarhide that is only let down by the sudden inclusion of some experimental filming techniques that are nowhere else in the film and feel out of place. The final thing I think is worth mentioning is that both films are supposed to be set in the 1980s and need to be because of that's part of the plot. But Manhunter is the only one that feels like it's set in the 80s. I mean obviously it helps that it was actually made in the 1980s but even so there isn't really an element of Red Dragon that feels like it's set in the 80s. Despite it being crucial not just to the plot but because this film leads almost directly into the start of Silence of the Lambs, which was set and made in 1990. In Manhunter, Graham works out it's someone who works at a film developing lab because the families that have been murdered have all had Super 8 home movies developed at the self-same lab, and that happens to be the lab that Francis Dollhide works at, so the killer must have watched them on these home movies. In Red Dragon is similar but it's VHS home movies that have been professionally edited. I assume this is because they didn't think the audience would know what Super 8 film was or how it had to be developed before you could watch it. Of course now VHS looks as dated as Super 8 film but even so I'm not sure if professionally edited VHS home movies were ever even a thing. Uh, the whole point of camcorders was that you didn't need to send them off. You could do it all from home. And if you wanted to edit them, you could do it yourself, even if you did over-rely on star wipes. There are other wipes besides star wipes. If it were made today, you would have to completely rewrite this plot device. And it would have made sense to do that in 2002, rather than change it slightly as to not really make sense. Other than that, there's no sense that this isn't a contemporary film. 
which is just a bit confusing. Home video. A, a full-length VHS tape compiled from shorter tapes. In conclusion, Red Dragon isn't an awful film. It's just below average. The pieces don't fit together that well and the performances don't really connect with the material in the right way. It deserves a more talented director and a better script. One that isn't so precious to the source material and can more seamlessly fit the additional lector scenes into the overall plot. Manhunter isn't perfect either. It's a little rushed and some of it looks a little dated but everything is handled better and the ending is far more refreshing than Red Dragon which because it's so different to how thrillers typically end it seems more original. It's funny that Manhunter is averting a trope that didn't exist when it was made while Red Dragon fully commits to a cliche that was already well established because it sticks to the source material. I think Manhunter works better as a prequel to Silence of the Lambs too. It's a better standalone film and is a better crafted film. It's definitely nothing but the best for me. But is Red Dragon nothing but the worst? Yes, because Brett Ratner is a scumbag. Thank you. Goodbye.